up for some Python programming. Yay. So excited. As long as you don't say the word passion, we're okay around here. Oh, I went to a meetup on Wednesday night. Went to a meetup on Wednesday night. And this poor little big-eyed, big-eyed noob was like, I'm so passionate for technology. And then I screamed at him for 15 minutes. It's like, you will never say that word around me again. Passion, passion is for startup founders to get you to work for free. That's what passion is. Uh, man. You can be hyped, you can be hyped. Just don't be passionate. Uh, let's see, here's people, five minutes. Oh, uh, to scribble down. Oh, to be clear, any of you all out there, if you're using Windows, it's not my fault you're using a crap operating system. Man. Again, just a just a warning out there. I've said this a few times. So um when you're dealing with technology, you're really dealing with the entire is that a stack? I don't know. You're dealing with the entire stack. And so one of the issues you can run into is you can do everything perfectly in the layer that you're dealing with. So let's say Python, you can do everything perfectly there. But if you have an issue with like the operating system layer of the stack, then your code can still not run or be buggy as hell. Um, what I found with development is Windows is garbage. Windows is trash, right? Especially when you start dealing with things like artificial intelligence. Once we get to start getting to the really cool stuff, the Windows people are going to be just sad. Um, device driver, eh, Windows is a damn mess. I don't know, it just is. Again, I'm not telling you to pay money. I'm not telling you to buy a Mac. You can buy a piece of crap and put a Ubuntu onto it. Ubuntu works great. Uh, but anyways, one of the things just to keep in mind for anybody that's here right now is so today we're going to be dealing with the OS module, the operating system module. So the cool part about this is this actually can send commands directly to the operating system. And then you get all of the power of every command line utility that's on your system. Uh, and now you can pull that into your Python app, right? So ping, tracert, top, I don't know, whatever the hell it is you're doing, FTP, I suppose. Uh, Anyways, the, the warning that I will give you is, um, you know, Windows. Windows. It's quirky. It's quirky. So, uh, so everything I want to show you today uh, basically works. It works. And it works on Mac. And with a tiny bit of a modification, it'll work on Linux. And if you're using Windows, well, get used to troubleshooting. Get used to troubleshooting. Uh, that's the thing. Uh, people who use Macs uh, write code. Uh, people who use Windows troubleshoot. Yeah, guess how it is. Oh, let's see. So, yeah. That is going to be a thing to think about going into the future, however much you want to invest and in following along with me with Silicon Dojo. Because, uh, again, there's a lot of cool stuff. There's a lot of cool shit we're going to do, like uh, open CV. We're going to do computer vision. Uh, we're going to do computer voice and speech. We're going to do AI. Uh, I'm just telling you, man. <laughs> installing that onto Ubuntu or installing that onto Mac OS, it takes about five seconds. Run command. You're done. Uh, getting it to work on Windows. <laughs> Have fun with that. Um, I had a buddy of mine, like, uh, I had one of my buddies was talking about that when I was talking about transitioning. Because I got my MCSE, I got my MCSE back in 2000. And I was a Windows fanboy for years. I love Active Directory. Oh, I'm an Active Directory fanboy. But anyways, I was talking to one of my friends about that when I migrated to Mac. And he was like, but Eli, but Eli, I've learned all of these skills on Windows. What will I do when I get to Mac? And it's like, just use your damn computer. Mac doesn't have a registry. You know what you don't have to troubleshoot if you don't have the registry. Thanks. Don't be mad at me. You pick a crap operating system. And again, free one. Uh, just to be clear, too. 
When I say getting a lab computer, again, I literally do not mean buying a $3,000 computer. Uh, this is what we use. So when we were doing the in-person Silicon Dojo classes, this was one of our lab computers. This is a 2012 MacBook Pro that I bought for 130 bucks, slapped a SanDisk solid state drive in it, put Ubuntu into it, and this is pretty damn good as far as a lab computer is concerned. Uh, with the higher functioning things, again, once we start getting AI and computer vision, it's, it's a fucking 13-year-old computer. It is what it is. Um, but uh, for, um, you know, for uh, doing most of the Python stuff, it actually works really, really well. Uh, and again, like a lot of people don't think about, like with, um, with the Macs, with the Intel Macs, you can install other operating systems, any Intel operating system you can install. So look at this. See, I try to be a good instructor. I will suffer through Windows to try to teach you people. But yeah, it's actually, it is literally Windows. Um, this is a 2013 MacBook Pro. That actually works pretty damn well. Again, you can boot Ubuntu onto this. You can boot Ubuntu, Ubuntu onto any, uh, should be able to put onto any uh, Intel uh, MacBook. Um, so again, if you're looking for a lab computer, this is a phenomenal setup. But anywho, or you could buy a Mac. Or you could buy a Mac. Bum, 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 bum. Mm -hmm. Had real trouble recently with Ubuntu 24.04 2D window manager acceleration drawing glitchy flickering windows. Don't want to start a fight here, but Ubuntu is not as easy as it used to be. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> That's why I use Mac. I'm not going to get into a fight with you about Ubuntu. I'm telling you Ubuntu is a fine option. I use Mac. I use Mac. I have so much Mac hardware. So much Apple hardware, I suppose. Okay. Wow, look at that. We got 10 people. We got 10 people. That, that is what I love about meetup is you have 65 people sign up and 10 people show up but anyways i'm just here to teach people if i can teach 10 people i'm happy teaching 10 people it's all good as far as i'm concerned uh so let's uh let's start the class uh again yeah i didn't go around to scribbling crap anyways uh if you're on windows uh, i'm gonna do my best i'm going to do my best for you if you're on windows today to try to show you how all of this works just realize if you're on windows you get to troubleshoot isn't that why you bought windows so that you could spend all of your time troubleshooting anyways we're gonna try again one of the big things to understand uh when you're doing technology again is this concept of stack and this is why it sucks to teach noobs technology because if there is any failure at any part in this tech stack what you did isn't gonna work and the problem with noobs right i've been doing this for forever right i can i can recite the osi model and the whole nine yards right so for me if i write all my code and it's not working i'll troubleshoot it just to verify it, and then i'll go down the stack to figure out what the problem is the problem with noobs is they don't even know the stack exists they just think it's their code and so literally they rewrite their code 500 times and then they give up they do not fail they give up because they're not smart enough to make technology work and now what they don't realize is the real is the reason their code was not running here was because you had a permission issue down at the uh, at the operating system level and ergo you couldn't do what it is that you wanted to do uh, and so that's one of the things uh, just to keep in mind. That's also why I try to simplify uh, all these classes. Again, I get some old timers taking these classes for some reason. It's really weird. Like I'll have professors take my classes and then they'll complain about my classes. <sighs> Anyways, that's its own special kind of help. And one of the, the points that I try to make with my classes is that a lot of times instructors, basically, they it's not that they overcomplicate it. They actually teach you the quote unquote right way to do everything. But they teach you so many things that you don't remember any of them. 
And then when you go to actually do something, none of it works. So again, just so you understand my bias, my teaching style, I always try to keep something, everything as dirt simple as possible so that you can learn the specific concept that you're trying to learn. And then hopefully we can move on. A year from now, we will teach you best practices. Right now, I want you to understand how try accept statements work. In a couple of months, we'll, we'll get to making sure those damn things are secure. But anyway. Uh, as far as the classes go, again, if you're new to the classes, this is Silicon Dojo, a third list gatekeeper list, free to the end user, hands on technology education that empowers students to do whatever they think is important. I've been doing tech education since 2009 on YouTube, and there's a very powerful thing on YouTube with basically this idea of I could get paid, uh, you could get educated, the world was a great place. What if technology education? was just open and it was available and it was like water. If you wanted education, you could just turn the tap and get education. That is basically the concept of Silicon Dojo. Uh, free to the end user uh, is not actually free. I do need, need to get money somehow. Uh, sponsors are not coming to me, surprisingly. Intel is not coming to me to give me money for doing these classes. Uh, so we do have DonorBox. Uh, if you want to throw some money into the DonorBox account, it's donorbox.org slash ETCG. You can dump some money into there. Uh, I am going to start pushing this more in the fall. Uh, my life is a bit of a disaster right now. So I'm doing these classes right now, but I'm not really pushing this. In the fall, hopefully, we're going to be having multiple classes per week. We're going to be having study halls. We're going to be having a lot of other stuff going on. Uh, and so once we get to that point, I will start truly e-begging. But that does uh, exist. Uh, raise your hand in Zoom. If you have a question in Zoom, uh, ra raise your hand. Where the hell that thing shows up? I guess it's showing up over there. No, I always get that wrong. I don't know, wherever the hand raising thing shows up, uh, raise your hand uh, in Zoom. Again, I literally get students who raise their hand. God bless. It's adorable. It's also gorgeous. This is not going to get my attention, just so we are clear there. Uh, let's see here. Uh, uh, all the material, again, if you go to GitHub, uh, all the material for these classes is at GitHub. Uh, we have the slides uh, in Keynote, so you can modify them in PDF. We have workbooks, we have lab books. Uh, all the code is there, the lab code, all of that is there. All of this is basically given to you uh, as part of the product. Uh, this is what I'm doing right now. It's only a very small thing, but I'm trying to do with Silicon Dojo. A bigger concept is the idea of Silicon Dojo. So anyways, all of that material, not only you can take for personal use, but you can take it and go teach your own classes. If you want to take those though, that material and go teach people, that's great. If you want to charge to teach people, that's great. Um, it's all there for you. Uh, tippy tap or die. Uh, again, a lot of people that get into the technology profession uh, think that they are just going to sit there and through osmosis, they are going to become technology professionals. Uh, that's not how the technology profession works. Uh, if you do not experience, if you do not work, if you do not do it, you will not be a technology professional. Uh, understanding the commas and the quotation marks and the single quotation marks and the parentheses and the, the colons and the difference between a colon and a semicolon and yeah, right? And that's the stuff that's very important for you that will get you ahead. So we're gonna have labs at the end of these classes. We generally always have three labs. We got a boop. Anyways, we, we generally have three labs and uh, I would recommend that you do them, right? So you have VS code, you have Python installed, plus whatever else we tell you to install. Uh, and you actually go through and you write all that code out. Um, you write all that code out and, um, you know, why are people talking? I am talking. Put your hand up. Who's talking? Who's talking? Come on. Somebody talking? Anybody talking? Anyways, this is running the class. Um, so anyways, uh, do the work. Uh, let's see here. Uh, extra help. Uh, W3schools.com is absolutely fabulous if you need additional work. And again, chat GPT. It's not artificial intelligence, but if you need help figuring out where you forgot your semicolon or whatever, uh, that'll work. Uh, and standardization. So we use VS Code and we use uh, the, the default settings. The reason for this is just to standardize everything. There are a lot of different IDEs out there. You can write Python literally in Notepad 
But again, standardization just makes everybody's life a hell of a lot easier. So you can use whatever the hell IDE you want. Again, you're not going to get a grade here, but if you need help and I pull it up on the screen and I have no idea what I'm looking at, uh, it's going to be a long day for both of us. Um, yeah, so anyways, there we go. Let us get into the class. So there was a question. Does somebody have something to say? We're going to get into the class then. Uh, so we're going to be talking about Python, custom functions, and the OS module. Uh, so basically, uh, custom functions, uh, what a function is, is a function. Oh, yeah. Are people being annoying or they do not know how to use Zoom? I'm about to turn off all of your mics in a second. Okay, let me turn off all your mics. We're just going to, we're just going to make my life a little easier and turn off. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Hi, this is stressful enough. Anyways, custom functions and the OS module. So basically what we're talking about, when we're talking about functions is these are, uh, you can think of them as apps within your script, right? So you need some kind of functionality, right? Uh, let's say you want to send an email somewhere. Uh, let's say you want to pull in information um, from a, uh, a, a website. Let's say you need two random numbers, right? You don't want to rewrite that code every damn time you need uh, random numbers. So you're going to use something called a function. So we use a lot of functions, uh, basically built-in functions up until this point, like randint, right? From random import randint. So the randint is the function. And then you call randint. You give it a starting number zero and the end number of 100, and it will give you a random number between zero to 100, right? And that's basically all a function is. So this is code that has already been written. So when you need a random number, you need to send an email, you need to send a Twilio, you need to connect to a database, whatever. It just basically does all that for you. You use one little line of code. You don't have to, you know, rewrite 100 lines of code or 1,000 lines of code every time you want to do something. Uh, so basically what cu custom functions allow you to do is it allows you to basically create your own little apps uh, within uh, your script. Right. And so basically, if you're if you're going to do something that you're going to need to reuse that task multiple times, uh, basically uh, what you can do is you can create your own function and then you can call that function um, instead of having to, to rewrite it. Right. So instead of instead of like if you want to do hello, world, right, you can do a define hello function print hello world and then every time you want to say hello world uh, within your script you can simply call hello world open parentheses close parentheses and that will do that couple lines of code now again imagine if that's a hundred lines of code or a thousand lines of code instead of rewriting that every damn time you can just call that function uh, for it to work so that's what we're talking about when we're talking about custom functions uh, and then the os module uh, this is a great little tool basically what the os module allows you to do is it allows you to connect directly to the operating system now again a big one big problem when a lot of new people get into technology is they're always trying to figure out how to reinvent the wheel. How am I going to get my web app to ping things, right? And then they sit there with their CSS and they try to figure out how to make CSS ping hosts, which is not going to work, right? So the cool thing that you can do in the real world is you can use something like the OS module and you can have your web app, right? So you use a framework such as Bottle, Flask, Django, blah, and that creates your web app. And then if you need to ping something or do something where you're going to need to use uh, an operating system uh, level uh, tool, basically you can use the OS module to call that operating system level tool, have that operating system level tool do something, and get the response back, bring that into your script as a variable value, and then once it's a variable value, you get to do whatever it is that you want to do with it. Again, so you can ping and you can create folders and you can create files and do all that kind of uh, management stuff. And then that's one of the things that becomes interesting. Again, once you start using Python, as we talked about that before, is, is the value of Python as a language is it's really a super glue of the modern world. So not only can you create a web app, uh, not only can you create scripts to do whatever, but you can also use this for like administrative tasks, right? So you could create a Python script uh, let's say you have a thousand users. Um, 
you know, you know, people get fired in your company. That's what happens. And so you have all of these, uh, these home folders for users. And you basically want to take uh, every account that's been disabled or no longer exists. And you simply want to move those folders into long-term storage so that you don't want to mess with them anymore, right? So again, any, any employee that's currently working, you want to make sure that all of their data gets backed up on a daily or preferably like hourly basis. Uh, but if you have employees that previously worked for the company, maybe you don't want the data deleted. You do want it backed up, but not very often. You can put that into basically some kind of cold storage type thing that only get backed up, let's say once a month or whenever there's any changes. So one of the things you can do is you can have Python, right? The Python could read from a CSV file and determine uh, all the accounts that are still active and all the accounts that have been disabled, it can then look into a, your folder structure to see what uh, home directories are there. And then it can start basically auto moving things around uh, based off of whatever parameters have you decided. And the great part about that is you can actually just do that uh, all within Python. Um, can I test my mic? I do not know if it's working. No, no, test your mic. Oh, people. So anyways, functions. Functions are like apps within your script. Uh, basically, the idea is you reuse your code, you write once, and then use a gazillion times. Again, for a lot of new people out there, right, they walk into their, their environment, they get hired as a junior level developer, they walk into the environment, and then after about two weeks, they start getting really pissed. Right, because there's a senior developer over there, and that motherfucker, man, he's making a quarter million a year, plus he's got equity, and all you ever do is see him with his feet up on the desk. You know, like, that's ridiculous. I work my ass off every day, and I get paid pennies, and he's quarter million a year, plus he's got equity, and he's not doing a damn thing. If he works half an hour a day, I'd be surprised. And I'm going to tell you the reality. That's because his work is valuable and your work is not. Because real technology professionals reuse. You copy and paste and you reuse and you do not reinvent the wheel. It's a very important thing that I try to get into people's minds, right? If you're, if you're doing the same work more than like twice, you really should ask yourself whether you should create a script or something to do that for you, right? The lazy programmer is actually probably truly the most valuable programmer in your company. Unless they actually are just lazy. Uh, let's see, when you're dealing with functions, uh, one of the important things in Python is that they must be defined before they are called. Uh, so when you're dealing with Python, again, we've talked about this before, it's an interpreted language. So there's compiled languages and interpreted languages. So you have an interpreter, a Python uh, interpreter. Basically, uh, what's going to happen is when you call the script, that interpreter is going to read through the script, and then it's, the, it's basically going to turn it into that program, which is actually really kind of cool, right? So it reads through this text, and it moves files and folders around, or it reads through the text, and it gives you a, a web app, or it reads through the text, and it gives you a desktop GUI app, right? You, you get you get right click, you get left click, you get boxes, you get all this kind of stuff, and that all came from you just writing uh, text. But one of the important things with interpreters, it's understanding how the interpreter actually works. And so one of the things that some people complain about with the Python interpreter is that Python basically starts reading at the top and goes all the way down. So if you call something, uh, before it's been defined, and then Python has not read it yet, so therefore it does not know it exists, and so it'll fail out. So one of the things to be thinking about when you create these functions is do make sure you define the functions first. You always have to define the thing uh, before you're actually going to use it. Uh, let's see here. Uh, so yeah, so let's look at these uh, examples. Hello Pi and function layer Pi. Okay. Uh, so we take a look at this, right? And so this is basically what a function looks like. Yep, you guys can see that. Uh, so what we're first going to do is we're going to we're going to use def. So this is for defining a function. So you're going to create a function. You're going to say def. You're going to say space, and then you're going to say whatever the function name is. So the function name that we're going to have here is message. Open parentheses, close parentheses. So I'll show you this in a little bit. You can actually input uh, variable values there. We're not doing that right now. Uh, and then you do uh, colon. Then basically under this is 
everything that you want to have happen. Again, this could be a thousand lines of code under here. We're just doing one line of code because it's a class. Um, here, we're going to say print. This is an important message. And that is what this function is going to be. Uh, then down here, what we do is we call the function. And so when we call the function, it will then run this function. And pretty simple. All right, so if I go and I go to run this, uh, we can basically see that what pops out on the screen is this is an important message. Ooh, right? Why the functions are so useful is, again, if you want to do message, 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 right? All I'm doing is I'm calling that function four different times. And as you can see, now it will call that function four different times. Instead of having to write out all of that code additionally, I can just call it as many times as I want, wherever it is in the program that I want, and it will show up here. Uh, from there, we need the function layered. Uh, so basically within functions, um, is that the one we wanted? Yeah, that's one we wanted. Uh, we, can, we can actually put functions within functions. Um, so again, this can be things for like messaging, or you can pull information from one thing and put it into another, that type of deal. Again, one of the big things to realize with programming is as much like building a house. Um, there's science behind bricks and mortar that you have to do. Uh, but then past that, what you decide to do with bricks and mortar is kind of up to you. And again, that's one of the things to be thinking about with this is there's the there's the syntax. The syntax is the actual words that you use and spacing and all that. And then there's this thing like styling and uh, naming conventions, conventions, that type of deal for how you're supposed to do it within your particular environment. So anyways, we can layer here. Uh, so what we have here is we have a uh, function. Uh, so with this, what we're going to be doing is we're actually going to be inserting a variable value, right? So down here, we have name equals Bob, right? It's going to say print, hello, the name, and then it's going to call message, and then message is going to print out, we are glad you are here. We then come down here, name equals Bob, and then we call hello, so the hello function, we give it the name, variable name. And so what it should say is, hello, Bob, we are glad you are here. If we go through and we hit the enter, we can say, we can see, hello, Bob, we are glad, we are gold that you are here. Uh, again, the cool part with uh, this kind of thing is, again, with these variable values, all you do is you modify the variable value, and now we can see, hello, Sue, we are glad you're here. So again, when all we're doing here is we're using a single uh, variable value and we're manually inputting it, that doesn't look very exciting or anything. Uh, but imagine if you're pulling from a database, you're pulling from a CSV file, you're pulling from something. And so basically you have a list and this is gonna loop through a gazillion times. That's when this kind of thing starts becoming powerful. Again, imagine, imagine with this, imagine in here, if we dynamically created a message, and then we called an email function to then send that message to a particular email user. Um, that's basically what we got going on here with functions. And Jock Stroud, what's up? Jock. Three, two, one. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm a bastard. Anyways, ask to unmute. There we go. What's up? Thank you. So um, maybe I'm confused. So you say we have to define things first before, you know, as it's reading. And I know in previous classes, we, we, we've defined uh, what the function is. We don't have to define the variable first as well. So like you have define hello name and you have print hello name, but we don't have to put name equals Sue above print as a form of definition or is it something different because it's a variable? I don't know, right. kind of get my question. Yeah, yeah. so with this, that's where we gotta explain all this. So what's happening here is we are not calling this function until we get all the way here. So what's happened is Python is going to read through all of this. And so it's already going to know what name is. 
And so then it'll when it goes to hello, it'll put the name in there. And since it's already read what message is, since we're calling it, even though message seems like it's before, bef it's getting called after it's been read into Python. So again, this is like where it gets a little quirky sometimes. So basically, everything has to be defined before it gets called. And so with this, this stuff isn't actually being called until you get to line 10. Does that make sense? Nope. I'll allow you to unmute yourselves if you don't start. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, no, I'm not. Okay, I think I, I got it. So I'm sorry. Um, so basically you're saying like we have to define everything to that point. And you're saying like, but we're calling it hello name and the mess. But the thing about it is, is like we're defining the message as well, but it's not doing everything. On, okay, you just changed it. So yeah, so here it should fail out. Yeah, see, it fails out. See, name is not defined. Right. So that's where I'm saying is it's like with this. So name gets defined. And then we call the function. The function has already been defined. And then again, since message doesn't actually get called till here, message has actually been defined. So like we try to do we try to do this, it should just fail the hell out. Yeah, we get all uh yeah, see uh, hello is not defined, right? Because we're calling it before before we've actually defined it so just in, just as a general concept uh functions definitely go first and then you work then you have to put the value of uh, the variable right underneath that to could and then then you try to call it at the end as a kind of like a standardization as you say sorry that's not me uh <laughs> but that but you did i don't know if you heard my question like kind of like standardization uh Define the function, then try to work the variable, and then call it in that kind of like that order. Um, I don't know. We're gonna be doing more stuff. Uh, let's put a tack in that particular one, and come back to that later. Um, most of the time, you're gonna define all your functions at top, and then do your variables. There might be reasons. Mm -hmm. There might be reasons not to do that though. So, but yeah, let's let's just say in general, this is how it should look. Anyway, uh, Kevin K. Hi, uh, thank you. I think um, uh, on the line five, it's line three and five hundred message, right? So, as a best practice, um, I'm more comfortable defining the message before, so that I don't need to mentally tracking uh, these messages defined afterwards. So. Uh, anytime I'm calling a function, I define prior to that as like a best practice. That's that's more uh, mentally like, easy for me to like keep track, right? Because otherwise, uh, right, you're right. Message is not invoked uh, up until um, hello is invoked. Uh, I think it's keeping track is uh, so just define before you invoke. In that sense, I would define message before hello. That way, uh, like best practice is that um, more easier to track in the real project because you have more functions and stuff like that, um, keeping track, you know. Yeah, so you could do define function before, define message before, define hello world, yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's more of a, like a best practice, easier for, to track if you have like more function. I'm just asking, is that a, is that a followed, like a best practice? Uh, that would be a better practice than this. I kind of just wanted to kind of show you guys <clears throat> how the interpreter reads through and then basically, once you get here, everything has to be defined beforehand. So yes, if I was probably if I was going to be writing this as an actual code, this would go first, then this would go hello, and then we go through. But again, this right now Thanks. is just a class to kind of get you to understand what's going yeah, on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Cool. Yep. Uh, Mike W. Hey, is my mic working? Your mic is working. Is it like clear? Yeah, you know, whatever. So it sounds a like window. Okay. Sounds like one. Okay. I just want to make sure it was working. Thank you. Yeah. Is that it? Fuck me. Okay. Yeah. 
Oh, okay. I'm going to mute you all. Um, okay. So, Kevin, lower hand, lower hand. Okay. And then I'm going to go back to muting you folks. There we go. Um, yeah, that's one thing. Like, I'm more than happy to, to answer questions. Do realize as an instructor that there's a lot going on here. <laughs> authority figures actually do do something and so like i said for like the questions or for that kind of thing like like let's not test mics let's not do that kind of thing like i'm trying to teach <laughs> oh if you go to ask a question and your mic doesn't work then we will try to troubleshoot okay uh so we start talking about function inputs right so basically um Oh, when you're looking at this, uh, this is basically a, a function with a void input. There's no input to it, and it just fires off. It does something. Again, you could have it ring a bell or turn on a light or do something, right? Anyways, uh, but if you want to actually uh, send uh, values to a function, you are able to do that. Um, Position uh, of the the, uh, the the values, the the, the variables that you're sending uh, matters, and not the name itself. So that's an important thing. Like a lot of times, we get confused with names. Um, the names, and again, I'll show this to you in a second. Don't matter. It's the position. Uh, there is a local versus global variables. Um, so you start talking about things like namespace, and namespace becomes very important whenever you're dealing with programs. And basically, the idea is what can call or at least see another variable value, uh, especially when you start getting long programs. Let's say you get 1,000 lines of code, 10,000 lines of code, or whatever. One of the big issues that you're going to run into is that whole idea of naming conventions for variables, right? Variable values or variables. <clears throat> and so one of the issues that you can have is, let's say you have one function here that uses a variable name and then some other function, you know, a thousand lines down uses the same variable name because people weren't thinking about it then you can have a bit of a disaster if the that namespace is the same if both functions can see the exact same variable so that's where you have the idea of local versus global variables so with a global variable the idea is that the variable value is accessible through the entire script so you can define the variable and then that value and that variable name is accessible through the entire script what a local uh, variable means is only in the function itself you 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 um you create the variable, you set the variable within that function, but then as soon as that function is done, that variable goes away. It's no longer usable by anything else uh, in the program uh, to make sure that you don't run into problems. Uh, let's see here. We go to function inputs. Is this one? Okay. So basically, this is kind of sort of like what we we're looking at before. So we're going to define uh, a function. Again, it's just going to be a hello function. So we do hello. Uh, then we're going to be putting in uh, the uh, the name of the variable that we're going to use. And we're going to say print hello, and then the value for that variable. We come down here, and what you'll notice is we see student equals Bob. So we create the variable student string of Bob. We come down here to call the hello uh, function, and what you'll notice is we put in the student variable name, because this is what we have. So, so right now, we're calling this, this variable, we're calling this student. So that's what we're dealing with. When we send it up to this function, what this function is going to care about is it's going to care about the position, so the index position. So what is, what's going to happen is hello at index zero is going to be the name Bob. And so up here, basically index zero, here we're going to call it name. So we're going to have a variable name, let's say name. And so we're going to do print hello name. So even though it's called student down here, once it gets into the function, we're going to call it name. And so that's, that's one of those things uh, that can be useful, again, if you're dealing with a lot of oh, different values that are coming in from a lot of different things. You may name it differently for some reason. And then when you send it to the function, in order to keep everything kind of the same within the function, you can just have the name, and that's only going to reside in the function. So if we go here and we print this, it's basically like what we did before. And so it's going to say, hello, uh, oops, no, it's because I didn't clear that out. 
Anyway, so let's run that again. And then this just simply says, hello, Bob. So hello, and the value that came in. Uh, again, I can come down here and I can say Sue, very simply. I can hit the go button and now it says, hello, Sue. That's basically what we saw before. And so this is where we're sending the variable value up to hello. Now, again, that does not look very sexy. That does not look very interesting. You're not here for that kind of simplistic coding. We want to do something a little bit more dynamic, right? And so here we have a list, right? And so we talk about a list like this. Again, a list like this, it could be pulled from any numbers of data stores. It could be pulled from a database. It could be pulled from files. It could be pulled from AI, whatever. Anyways, we created this list. This is for the group. Group equals, we have a Bob, we have a Sue, we have a Patty. So what we're going to do here is we're going to say for name in group. So for X, for every item in group, we're going to do the hello function and the name. So we're going to send each value up to here, and then it will loop through and say that three different times. So I click on that, and we can say hello, Bob, hello, Sue, hello, Patty. Right? And the cool part about doing this kind of thing with this kind of function, and again, we talk about things like dynamically, uh, we can add Fred, oh, and we can add um, Bill, and we can add uh, Tom, and then basically when we run this, right, now it's Bob, Sue, Patty, Fred, Phil, and Tom, so basically however many, oops, what the fuck is somebody doing at the whiteboard? Okay, why, why are we talking? Oh my God, I've done like 10 of these classes so far. You people are about to drive me up the damn wall. No whiteboards. No, I don't, I don't know what you people are doing. Stop. Oh. So anyways, so it's able to dynamically go through. And again, think about this with like an email messaging service, right? You want to send out emails to however many email addresses you have. You have a function to send out those email addresses, uh, and it will be able to loop through. Uh, let's see here. Jock, uh, what's up? Okay. Um, I kind of saw what you did. And so, yeah, as you, as you go back up to the line. So could you go over again why we didn't have to equal, like, say, student equals name? Because I could see... In the previous one, you said, so basically name is student. We saw that, but we don't have to show in the code that name equals student and student equals Sue. You can see it's a question I have. I'm, I'm, I'm saying, like, why didn't we have to write that in the code? You kind of see the question I'm asking? Because it's the index point. So think about this as, again, Instead of thinking of this as a name, as as the the variable name, this is an index as far as the code is concerned. So hello. Okay. So the 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 variable we're sending up is at index zero. So when we come up here, what we're saying is we want index zero to be called name. Gotcha. So here it's like we're basically we're putting into index zero the value for student. When it comes up to function, what we're saying is we want index zero. The, the variable name there to be called name, and then we'll call it from there on out. Okay, thank you. That uh, now nah, I I got it now. And then when you put group, the name name equals so Tom, Bob, Sue, Patty, Fred, and Phil is yeah. all index. Could you just say that all of that is index zero? Well, yeah. Well, so what what it's doing is it's looping. So so for group, group is a list. So index mm -hmm. zero, index one, index two, index three, two, index three. Four, okay, index I got you. And so it's saying for index zero, do this. For index one, do this. For index two. And again, like I say, this name really doesn't. Um, Frank O phone, right? It doesn't matter what the hell that's called. Frank O phone. All right, that's just. Again. So we're saying for, so we're saying as we loop through this list, this is the variable name we're going to use for each list item, and then we're going to send that up to the function. Gotcha. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. 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 Okay. Um, 
input function, function input multiple. Um, okay. Uh, and so, again, we started talking about the index. So, again, one of the things, like we talking about index zero, but we've only got one item. Again, do remember, if you're new here to programming, when you deal with lists, when you deal with dictionaries, when you deal with sets, the numbering starts at zero. When you deal with other things, the numbering starts at one. Man, it's computers. Anyways, so basically what we have here is we're having uh, a, the, the hello function, basically like we had before, but now we're going to be sending two values to it. So at index zero is going to be name, comma, index one is going to be age. So now we can say print, you know, hello, the name, I see you are, whatever age that you are. Uh, so here again, I'm just using a, a different uh, variable name, just so you see, it doesn't have to be this. Again, it's that index. So salutation, again, equals Bob, years equals 25. So what we do is we say, hello, salutation. So Bob is gonna go in there, years, 25 is gonna go in there. So at index zero is gonna be Bob, which is now gonna be called name. Index one, is going to be uh, age, which will be 25. So 25 will be sent up here. We'll now call it age. And so name is, you know, I see you are X age. And if we go through and we run this, uh, so hello, Bob is C. Anyway, I see you are however old. I see, right? And so again, if you start looping through, you can do this on mass if you're pulling this information from a database uh, or that type of thing. And so you can add quite a few variable values. I don't know what the limit is. A lot, probably, a lot. Uh, but basically all you do is you do the comma. Uh, and so index zero, index one, index two, index three, index four, so on and so forth, index zero, one, two, three, four and so forth. Um, and so that's that's how you can send a lot of different data uh, to the variable. Again, that's one of the things as far as best practices concerned. Uh, we're not going to go into global variables today just because I don't want to confuse people. Um, but the idea is the way that you should be sending variable values is through this and not through the global variable scheme. Again, if you go and do some Google searches on global variables and you go, well, that's a lot easier. It's like, yeah, it is a lot easier, but it's also easier to tank your script at the same time. So anyways, this is the basic idea of how you can send uh, multiple uh, variable uh, values. Uh, let's see here. Let's see, go down. Uh, then we have returns, right? So basically uh, with this, all that we've done at this point is say hello. Right. And so and so that's what you can have. Again, you can have a variable that does not give a return. It just does something. It fires off an email, blase, blase, all these other things. But sometimes you want a return. You want a value back. Uh, let's say if you if you're doing math. Right. I want to be able to give two numbers, have it do something to those two numbers and then return a value to me so that I can then use that in the rest of the script. Right. Or I may want uh, to use some kind of AI services. Right. So so I have this input. I want to send it off to an AI service. I want to then get that value back and then do something with it, uh, put it into a database or any of those types, types of things. And so that's when we're talking about uh, returns. Uh, functions can return variable values. Uh, multiple values can be based, uh, can be accessed based on an index. So when you're dealing with these functions, you're going to be dealing with indexes of 0, 1, 2. So that's where it can get confusing because you start focusing so much on the names, the words, that you forget that it's actually looking for the index number. Don't worry so much about the, the name. That's index 0, index 1, index 2, so on and so forth. You can also, to make your life a hell of a lot easier, uh, is return a dictionary or a list, any kind of set. So basically, the one variable value that you send back to whatever is requesting it, you can actually send back a dictionary, and then it might be easier for you to parse that dictionary. Instead of trying to remember what's at index 0 and what's at index 1 and what's at index 2, if you send a dictionary back, you can have name, age, birth date whatever else, and then just be able to call based off of the name of that index. Uh, let's see. So return.py. Let's do return.py. Uh, 
And let me close. Let's see here. There, yeah, I'll return that pie. Uh, okay, <clears throat> so this is basically what it starts looking like uh, when we have a return, right? So we're going to define uh, math. So it's just the basic math thing, all right? Math num one comma num two index zero index one total equals num one plus num two and then we're going to return total response equals math so we're going to send 23 and 44 so we can either send a variable name or we could just send a value like we're doing here and then we're simply going to print the response out. Uh, when we do this we can see that we get the answer 67. So if you only have one return value that comes back, you don't have to call it based off the index. You can just call it. And so basically here, again, we're at going to add 23 plus 44. It's going to return what that total is, and that prints out 67. If uh, I did a 49999, again, we can just run and run this, and it gives me a response of uh, for that. Uh, 45,022. And so basically that's what we're taking a look at when we're taking a look at these returns. And so what we can do is again, we can call, we can call the, the function, we can send the variable values or the values to the function, and then we can simply have the new variable. So our new variable equals whatever the return from that function is, and then we can do whatever it is that we want with that variable. So again, that's one of the things with these functions, if you're processing stuff, you can, have a, uh, you can have a function process a lot of information, you return whatever values you care about, and then once you have those values, again, then you could have another function or something that would then store the, those values into a database or whatever it is that you want. Uh, let's see here. Uh, we have the return multiple, and this is where we can return uh, multiple um different values uh, again so we define math again so num1 num2 colon so we're going to create a variable add equals num1 plus num2 sub equals num1 oops suppose i should be able to do my own code control s uh sub equals num1 minus num2 mult equals num1 times num2 so we can return basically it looks a lot like how we provide the variable values return add comma sub comma malt so at index zero is going to be the value for add at index one is going to be the value for sub and at index three is going or index two is going to be the value for malt response equals math 33400 uh, we're going to print out the response and i want to show you this uh, and then we're going to print out the type of the response and again we've talked about data types before and you do have to be careful about the data types you're dealing with uh, so when we do this um, what we can see is when we call the response the response that we're going to get back here let me um hold on one second let me get the terminal there we go. Increase the size there a little bit. So the return that we're going to get back is going to be within these parentheses. So this is what's called a tuple. So again, we've talked about uh, sets before. So in a lot of programming languages, again, you just basically have arrays that you're dealing with in Python as part of the standard, they have what are called sets. Uh, there's a list, again, a, a um, all the all the values are at a numbered index, a dictionary, all the values are at a named index, that type of thing. Uh, tuple, tuple is interesting. Uh, basically, it's like a list, only it's not sortable, uh, which is an important thing, right? So if you're getting things like X, Y values, so again, you're dealing with a computer vision, you're dealing with, uh, things coming from computers, again, data that's coming in, you have to process it. The last thing in the world you want is that information to be sorted by accident. What happens if people sort your X, Y axis based alphabetically? Disaster occurs. Uh, so whenever you're dealing with data, uh, it'll generally return back a tuple. And a tuple is essentially, just think of it as a list uh, that is not sortable. 
So returns back this. So you'll see the add uh, for the add was 433. The subtract ends up being negative 367. And the multiply equals uh, 13,200. Now, if all I want is a particular value, let's say, uh, again, I just want sub. So I just want to subtract. Then I can simply do print response at index one index zero, index one, and it should give us that negative number. So it gives us the negative 367. Uh, Kevin, what's up, Kevin? Yeah, thank you. Just a quick question. Uh, when you return that multiple values, uh, is it nice to put within a, you know, the parenthesis indicates the tuple or it's, it's, I know it's implied tuple uh, within the parenthesis or like bracket, you know what I'm talking about? Not required on line six. What's that? Like a tuple, yeah. Like a, I thought tuple is like within a parenthesis, right? Like brackets, X comma Y. That's the usual way of to put a tuple. Up. That's not required. I mean, well, yeah, because, well, no, this is what it's, this is how it returns it. I'm not, I'm not doing a special formatting for this. It's just returning to me as a tuple. Like the, the default okay, so standard of the return okay. is tuple. So you don't need to specify with, I thought you had to specify within the brackets, like that's what my understanding, previous understanding, but it looks like you don't need to, you just passed X comma Y and it returned as a tuple automatically. Yeah. So default standard, it returns automatically. If there's another way to do it, I'm not sure. Again, no, no, I don't you can, know. I'm... You, you, again, you can return, and I'll show that to you in a second. You can return a dictionary. You can return at index zero some other data type and then it can just process that normally but just as 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 a standard what it's going to be returning is this as a tuple this is a tuple so how does the calling like uh, i understand here because you are writing let's say you're calling a library which returns some function call or somebody wrote so you you always do type off of that a function return and then read it that's uh because by convention you can have more than one value or one value could be dictionary or tuple or so how does we know as a caller, like what is the type? We just call type and then figure it out. That's the usual way. Yeah, so if you don't know what, what data type you're dealing with, because do remember in Python, Python automatically assigns data types sometimes, and sometimes it assigns data types you don't want. Uh, so if you're trying to figure out what the hell is going on, the type function, and then you just plug in the, uh, the variable name, and it will tell you what the type is so that you can deal with it. Oh, thank you. That's yeah. thanks. Okay. Let's see here. Uh, we have that, and then we have the return dictionary. Um, so again, this is basically what we did before. But again, one of the things you have to be thinking about when you're writing these scripts is maintenance and support. Uh, so one of the big problems, again, in the technology world is everybody says, I understand. That's great. Is somebody five years from now going to understand what the hell you were coding? Right. And so if you're getting these returns, it's simply index zero, index one, index two, that can be a bit of a pain to deal with. Uh, so one of the things that you can do uh, is you can simply uh, return something like a dictionary. And then when the people get the return back, they can simply print out what the return is and go, oh, that's pretty easy to understand. Right. Because before when we're when we're getting that tuple return, all we're getting is the values. We don't get the name, right? So we're not getting add equals 100 and subtract equals negative 300 and multiply equals 5,000. You're just getting 100, negative 300, 5,000, right? So if you basically set this up as a dictionary, when the return comes back, it will come back with those nice um, named key indexes so people have a basic idea of what the hell the numbers are or whatever the data is that they're dealing with. Uh, so this is basically uh, what we dealt with before. So to find uh, math, number one, number two, uh, we're going to create a dictionary. So this can be whatever name you want, but dict equals. And so dictionaries are squiggles, the squiggle brackets, open squiggle bracket, close squiggle bracket. Uh, to add values and add keys to a dictionary, all you do is you call the key that you want to add. So dict add equals num1 plus num2. Why did I keep doing that? 
this this is the problem with copy paste when you copy paste you copy paste your problems anyways dict sub equals number one minus number two dict malt equals number one times number two and then we're simply going to return dict so we're not doing you know multiple indexes here we're simply returning dict uh, response equals math 33 times 400 and then basically when we take a look at this right take a look at this when this runs now what we're going to get is add equals 433 subtract equals negative 367 and multiply equals 13,200 right if I get this return back I'm at least going to have half a freaking clue what's going on right and again that's one of the big things uh, if we look at class now, again, the class before used to be, or the, the type before used to be a uh, tuple, we now see it is coming back as a dictionary. Now with this, again, if we want to call a particular value, uh, so let's say I want to print the response for multiply, so I can now call that just as a named key in this dictionary, and now I'm going to get the 13,200. Right, so that makes life a lot easier for, for people to deal with. And again, that is the kind of thing that you do need to think about um, with this, you know, when you're writing all this out. Uh, let's see here. We'll go with Mike first, and then we'll go with Jock. What's up, Mike? Hey, do you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yep. Hey, so, um, one important, that's me. I'm not really well, I'm going to ditch you down. Like, I don't, I don't feel like that's very... You're breaking up, though. <laughs> Sounds like you have a bad internet connection, to be honest with you. Are you muted again? Ask to unmute. Okay. Yeah, so he messaged me all the way up so I can get you down. What? He messaged no. He messaged me with. You're breaking up. I don't. I don't know what's going on, man. Okay, uh, Jock, what's going on? All right, thank you. So, um, in your example, you defined the uh, the dictionary, yeah. but if we get uh, uh, the tr the numbers and we're are we getting a whole bunch of data, how can we how can we find out if someone made a dictionary for that? if we're just getting numbers because in your example we define dictionary we said dictionary add dictionary subtract dictionary multiply but is there a way we can call if we just get a number like how will we find out if there's a like you said we don't know what those numbers mean so what would we ask for if we got a whole bunch of data in a form how would we would we just put in the same thing like to find a dictionary to try to find that how will we how will we try to figure out what that is well, no. so if you're just getting a tuple back or you're just getting numbers back yeah you have to go find this damn function in the code and actually read what the hell they did uh wait a minute so we have to go through all the code this is like the debugging go through all the code and try to figure out what the variable would be or if there is a dictionary yeah well that would be the thing so if this is just let's say if this is just one essentially page of code all you would do is you should just be able to highlight math and then you go and you find where math was defined and then you read it right where this gets to be a damn disaster again with those imports when you're importing libraries or you're importing other files if you're importing this from something else yeah it's you've got to go you got to go digging basically because what you've got to get to to truly understand what's going on in this function you have to get to the function itself and read it right that's basically your you only get the amount of information that the that the original code or whoever coded last provides to you so if they're not giving you a dictionary or whatever else the only way to understand what's going on is to read the function itself and if that's five, six, ten year old cold, you just gotta yep. that's just it. It's just the oh, oh wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Uh Tom. 
How many people you hear me? Yep. Uh, them just pop the you guys. They got the deal. And we had the class already started. Really? Yep, class started. Oh, okay. Hour. Well, just pop it in. Making sure it started. Okay. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, let's see. Da, da, da. So that's the function returns. Uh, so that's basically again. That's basically all there is to functions. Again, what do you, one of the things you have to understand uh, about technology is most of what we do is not very complicated. Again, one of the reasons I'm very controversial is I actually think technology is simple. Right? There's a lot of little teeny tiny simple concepts that you can figure out in about ten minutes, and you stack a thousand of those damn things together, and you get Facebook or maybe a million. Right? And so basically, this really is all functions are. And so all that's going to happen from here on out when we start creating functions is we're just going to start creating more complicated functions, right? So we'll, we'll create functions that we'll call to open AI. We'll create functions that will send uh, emails out using things like SendGrid and that kind of thing. We'll create functions that will do all kinds of fancy math. Right, but the basic cons. This is all the basic concept of a function is, and then you just sit there and make it more complicated. Uh, so with the OS module, uh, so the next part of the class is basically how we're going to interact with the operating system. Uh, again, if you're using Windows, I'm so sorry for you. It's a tragedy that you were born with the wrong operating system. Um, with the OS module. This is going to allow Python to interact directly with your operating system. So all the command line utilities you have on your operating system, you are going to be able to access with Python. Again, the fun thing that you're going to realize is Windows is Windows. Windows is Windows. Because the thing is that you're going to be dealing with is basically um, whatever command line tools are available on your operating system, that is what you're going to get. What are the arguments? That is what you're going to get. What are the returns? Again, an interesting thing is Mac OS and Linux return the ping command differently uh, than Microsoft does. So literally, if you're, if you're trying to test for ping on Mac or Linux, you're going to test slightly differently than you're going to do on Windows. And that is one of the reasons why, again, in the, in the real world and technical world, many people just go with Linux because, again, it's that whole standardization thing. If I can write code and I can just simply deploy it to a Linux system and it's going to work, that makes life a lot easier. The other thing, too, again, we start talking with the, with the OS module. As you remember, security and privileges matter. Uh, the cool part about Microsoft, they've got Active Directory, right? Active Directory is a security service, allows you to do all kinds of amazing stuff, right? Just, just fabulous, right? You have secure, security policies on whether you can connect a USB drive, what printers people can use, whether they can get the task manager, all that kind of fancy stuff. Uh, the issue that you run into though, is if you try to run a script, that's communicating with the operating system. And this Windows box is locked down for whatever reason, and you can't even get to uh, uh, basically be able to do certain commands, then your script isn't going to function properly. Uh, one of the nice things with Linux is just how security and privileges and that kind of thing work in the Linux world. I think it's a lot easier, especially in that infrastructure environment. Uh, but these are the kind of things that you're going to have to uh, consider. Matt, you're... Anyways. Uh, let's see, allows you to send commands. Uh, it makes all the command line tools available in your Python script. So again, all the cool tools, uh, you know, whether you want to do FTP, whether you want to do um, uh, pings, trace routes, in-map, we're going to do an in-map class into the future. Basically, anything that you can do at the command line, you will now be able to do with the OS module. Uh, different OSs uh, use different base commands. Uh, and again, do beware of ping. So again, I talked about ping before. So how ping works in Mac and, and Linux is different than how ping works in Windows which is a pain because basically how you read the Windows reply is different than the Mac and the Linux world. The other problem though, is in the Mac and the Linux world, when you run a command like ping, it does not stop until you manually tell it to stop, right? So remember when you're writing this script, 
and you call something, right? You call an action to occur in the Python world. Um, everything basically goes, you know, forward to front to forward. Oh, is it blocking or whatever? Anyways, it just runs through the script. It's not going to go to the next part of the script until this command finishes, right? So let's say I'm doing kind of an up down tool. And so I say ping google.com. And that's all I do. So basically I say response equals essentially ping google.com. And I do that in Linux or I do that with uh, Mac. It by default doesn't stop. So once you run that command, Python is going to wait until it gets a response, but that command is never going to end because you're never going to manually be able to kill it. And so your script is going to lock up. Your script locks up at scale and your entire server can crash. Uh, so uh, when you're dealing with something like ping uh, for Mac or Linux, you actually have to put a count in there. Ping space hyphen C for count space one or however many times you want to ping space whatever the hell it is that you're trying to ping. So basically you're telling it to ping for this amount of times and then stop. And so that's one of the things that you're going to have to be thinking about when you start dealing with the, these command line utilities is do they stop on their, their own? Do they automatically do something and give a return or do they start and then they're waiting for you to do something, right? If you have an automatic script, but what it's calling requires manual inputs, everything can kind of go to hell. Um, uh, there may be the question again for any uh, for many people out there that know anything about Python. Uh, there's something called the subprocess module. Again, remember in technology, there's always 20 ways to skin a cat. How you decide to kill your cat is up to you. Uh, the subprocess module actually allows you to send OS commands, just like the OS module does. Um, it's a bit more powerful. It's a bit more sophisticated. Um, the way I think about it is like in the Linux world, you know how there used to be the tool IF, there still is a tool IF config, and now you're supposed to use the tool IP. Uh, there used to be the tool, there still is a tool uh, apt git for installing an apt, now you're supposed to use apt. Basically, that's the same type of deal. Uh, think of the OS module as IF config or apt git and subprocess as IP uh, or uh, basically, you can do a lot cooler stuff with subprocess, but it is more complicated. And again, my basis here, what I'm trying to teach you folks, is to try to keep everything simple. So if you're going out there and you're like, oh, everybody else is talking about the subprocess module, yes, by all means use it. It probably is a better module. It's just more complicated trying to keep it simple. Uh, there is a question about if OS is deprecated. So what deprecated means is basically it's no longer used. Um, I see this come up. Am I going to have to ban somebody today? Don't make me ban somebody today. This class has been going so good. Um, as far as I've been able to tell, it's not actually been deprecated. Uh, if you go and you do Google search on the OS module, again, you go to Reddit or Stack Overflow or that type of thing. Um, you'll see people say, OS has been deprecated. I've actually not been able to identify that anywhere. So just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, let's see here. Uh, so we talk about the basic functions. Um, so basically within the OS module, you're going to get some basic functions and these can be very useful for you because these allow you to do things in an OS agnostic way, right? So you have the interpreter uh, and you install the interpreter onto the operating system that you're going to be dealing with. And so the interpreter knows what operating system that you're dealing with. It knows it's on a Windows machine. It knows it's on a Mac or a Linux machine. And so for a lot of very simple tasks, one of the things you can do is you can simply call an OS function and it will know how to do things properly on your operating system and just give you the results. Uh, the very important one is uh, for path, for file names. Um, so what is it? Linux is forward slash, Windows is backslash. Again, the fun of operating systems. So when you're when you're when you're going through the file directory, right? Uh, you know, change directory, backslash, backslash, 
blah, backslash, blah, backslash, blah. That's how you do it in Windows. Uh, if you're doing it in Linux, you do forward slash, blah, forward slash, blah. Right? Doesn't seem like a big deal. Ha! Ah, but what happens when you're manually typing out file paths? What happens when you're pulling in data for something for your Python script, and then you want to dump it into a folder? If you manually put in forward slashes or backslashes, what that means is when you try to run that script on the wrong operating system, it's going to fail out because it doesn't understand which slash you're using. Uh, so, like one of the, the basic things is like OS join. So, you can give it a directory and you give it a file name. And what it will do is you give it the information for the directory and you give it the information for the file name. And then it will join those two values together in the proper formatting for whatever operating system uh, that you're dealing with. Uh, so that's one of the things uh, to consider. And again, that's an important thing. Again, if you're sitting there and you're coding stuff on Windows and you hard code things uh, into your script and then you hand it over to somebody that's using Linux, if you hard coded in things like file paths, you, know, you might run into some significant problems. Uh, if we go over uh, to the OS example, I can show you this. Let's see, oh, that's an example. We got a lot of stuff going on here, All right? Uh, so for this, we're going to import the OS module. We're using a lot of different uh, functions here. So we're just gonna import the entire module. Uh, and then we're gonna do print os.name. So what this does is it allows us to ask, what is the name of our operating system? Uh, it's a little weird though, the response that you're gonna get. Um, Okay, Tom Baker. Well, uh, I like ban Tom Baker. This is and Tom Baker. Oops, no, no, you're Paul. Tom Baker, leave. You know, you try to get, well, you're going to get banned. Apologize for the people that saw the N word here. Uh, we're going to report you. Offensive. Submit. Done. Uh, you try to do good things. You're trying to go do that. Anyways. That's one of the problems is you try to make, make open available things that's accessible to everybody and the people are jackasses about it. Anywho, so you do os.name and so it's going to give you the name of your operating system. Here you're going to see it comes back as POSIX, P-O-S-I-X. Basically, I think any Unix type system is going to come back with POSIX. Uh, so Linux, is a, uh, Mac, um, and Unix will come back as a POSIX operating system. Uh, I do believe Windows uh, will come back with a different type of operating system. So that's one thing you can do is you can see you, when you run your script, you can say if the value comes back as one type of operating system, do this. If it comes back as a different type of operating system, do this, right? So we wanted to make this these scripts much more complicated and much more confusing. I could say basically if, um, you know, this is a, a, a POSIX machine. Uh, this is the value of this command. If it's Windows, this is the value for this command. So like when we go through, and I'm gonna show you how this works is like for clear the screen, right? So basically in Python, we can just have it clear the screen. So it looks a lot, just a lot easier to look at. So with Windows, the command is CLS. Uh, with Linux, Mac, it's uh, clear, C-L-E-A-R. So you could say, if Windows, command equals C-L-S, if POSIX, command equals clear, right? That's the kind of thing that you can do. Uh, let's see here. Um, we can do... Uh, we can do with the current working directory. So os.git current working directory. And so this is almost always going to be your root directory. If this is your computer that you set up based off of my instructions, it will be your root account. 
So home slash Eli, wherever your user account is. Uh, again, if you're using, um, you know, a, a legacy system, a system that's been around for a while, somebody may have futzed with it and put your, put your working directory somewhere else. Have fun. So os.get current working directory. Uh, what that'll do is it'll tell you where your current working directory is. And again, notice the slashes, right? So uh, uh, forward slash users, forward slash Eli. Uh, so if I was on a Windows machine, it would most likely give me uh, backslash users, backslash or whatever, pro backslash profiles, blah, 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 right? Anyway, so that's one of the things. And we got a whole bunch of different things here. Um, you can do a list directory. Uh, so basically, uh, in my current working directory, I can use this to list out all of the files. Um, so again, instead of uh, uh, Windows is DIR, right? Uh, Linux is ls, so instead of dealing with that, we can simply do list directory, so it'll do the appropriate command, so it shows you all of the files and folders in that particular directory. Um, let's see here. This is going to be an important one as we go, oops, go forward. Um, so if we want to do things like basically um, if we want to save to a very specific folder again that's where we can use this uh, this join so here what we're going to say is we're going to say file equals test.txt directory equals we're going to say os.get current working directory so path is going to equal os.path join and so basically we're going to join the directory that we care about with the file name and when we do that, it will print out that full path. So users Eli test.txt. So basically, we're going to use a version of that when we go into the future. So the, one of the problems right now is whenever we create these scripts, so we create the script and it's all the way buried down in our file directory, but then it's always either reading or writing back to our home directory. So that's a mess. So one of the things we can do is we can actually use these tools, a path tool, to essentially what we can do is we can say, I want to read or write to any folder that contains this file, right? So if my file is in a folder, I want it to just look within its own folder, not go all the way back to the root. And so that's one of the things you can do with this uh, OS module. Uh, and then you can do make directory. So uh, uh, basically, again, like simple things you can do, remove directory, make directory, all of that kind of stuff. And so here uh, I can do os.make directory, test for class. So again, uh, os agnostic. And then I can run this. It's not going to give me a return because it just did what it's doing. I can come here and go to Eli. And I can see that I just created a directory test for class. So again, if you're going to be doing any kind of this kind of folder or file management type of thing, it is better to do that through uh, the functions built into the OS module uh, versus trying to do that with hard-coded commands because, again, depending on the operating system, so on forth and so on. Sophie. What's up, Sophie? Nigga, 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 nigga. I don't, I don't understand. I don't understand. Anyway, anyways. Uh, okay. Let's see here. Um, so the OS, the system function. Uh, so basically, this is a function with an OS, and what this allows you to do is it allows you to send a command uh, directly to your operating system, but not get a return back. Uh, so sometimes you're going to want returns back. So again, you're doing ping or whatever else. You're specifically looking for a return. Uh, sometimes you want to return back just to know if something happened or not. Other times, you just kind of want to send a command uh, to the operating system. Um, just for it to do something. So again, like clear. So now that we're going to learn clear today, all of your UI is going to get a lot better going into the future. Um, commands are OS dependent. So again, Mac, Linux, clear, 
Windows CLS. Um, if we go over, take a look at OS.system. Uh, basically, this is what we have, right? So, uh, so we've got a couple of things here. That's commented out. Don't worry about the sleep. The sleep will be down here. So import OS. So OS.system touch touch hyphen text test.txt. Uh, so all the touch tool does is it simply creates uh, a file. It, it either it either modifies the file by doing nothing at, a specific, at, at when you call it, or it creates the file. Um, this is a weird tool that can be used every once in a while. It's good for instructional purposes. I'm not really sure I've seen a lot of touch in the real world. It's, it's good for uh, creating files. So if you need to create a file and folder directory automatically, touch might be a good thing. It just creates everything as empty, but it does create the structure for you. But anyways, all it's going to do is create the file, right? So, so touch, touch is the actual command, then the name of whatever it is that you want to create. So touch hyphen ts uh, test.txt. And so if I run this, again, we're not going to get a return back because this is just sending to the system. And if we go over here, we can now see we have touch hyphen test.txt. So again, we just want to send a command uh, and not get a return back. Um, with this, again, you can start doing something a little bit more interesting is, um, this is what we're going to start doing something like this, uh, more in the future. Uh, but just to show you how clear can be valuable. So we have this loop here. So number equals zero while number is less than or equal to 20, print the number num plus equals one. So add one to the number sleep for half a second and basically print that out on the screen. Right, so uh, so we do this, we can see zero, one, two, three, four, right? It's just, it's doing this. And every time we've done the scripts in the past, even the interactive scripts, this is basically what it looks like. And it's ugly and it's tedious and it's a pain in the butt. So what we have here, oops, what we have here is you do OS, so the OS module, the system function, and then you send the clear command to the system. That's going to clear the screen for you. Right. And so now when we run this, right, all right, zero, see now it's counting here. So every time it iterates through, it clears the screen so you don't have that mess. And so then you're just getting the nice little output. So again, like we've had those uh, interactive scripts um, where, you know, you ask questions, you do things. And again, every time you get the input, you just start getting this ugly ass, right? So with this one, what you can do is you can clear the screen before the input or after the input. So only the latest response is showing up there and it gives you a more useful piece of functionality there. And so that's basically, again, all the, all the system function does. Again, it really is a type of thing you've got to go out there and start learning, learning again, things like the Linux operating system. This is where we talked about before. Again, I get a lot of people out there and they're like, Eli, what is the language that I need to learn to be a technology professional? And it's like, oh man, you're in for a hard life. It's lots of them. It's lots of them, right? Because again, like the, thing, the things I've shown you already, I mean, you've learned Python, you've learned HTML, you've learned CSS, you're going to learn SQL, right? You've got to learn the Linux operating system, right? Just because I'm showing you how to run this in Python, right? This is the command for Python. Now you need to learn Linux so you know what the hell command to send to Linux. And that's before you get into permissions and security and all that kind of stuff. Uh, let's see here. Um, again, there is something called subprocess uh, run, uh, which is kind of interesting. So the subprocess module, again, different module you can use other than OS, they have a run function uh, that is, to be clear, more secure. More secure. Anyways, not sure I worry about it with you folks, uh, but again, if you want to take a look into this more, there's a subprocess run. Um, it is more secure, more stable. You can do more crap with it. Uh, then we have the popen function. 
basically what this does is it sends a command to the operating systems and basically uh, re returns back to you what would be shown on the screen. So if you do the ls command list, if you do ping, if you do trace route, whatever else, basically it's going to do that. Uh, and then you the, 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 the value is going to come back and you can assign that, that value to a variable name. Uh, do be careful uh, with popen. Remember, Again, your script is going to stop until that command finishes, right? So if you do ping, if you do ping, right? Ping timeout is, I don't know, a couple seconds or whatever. So if you try to ping something, it doesn't work for some reason, it times out, your script stops for a second or two. As long as you're not doing too much, that's probably not a big deal. Do be careful with things like trace route. So trace route's a really cool tool if you don't know what it is. Basically, it allows you to, to essentially ping every every hop you go through in order to get to something like a host a website so basically uh, it'll find your local router it'll find your isp's router it'll find the next router it'll find the next router it'll find the next router right down to like 30 30 different levels well the thing is that takes a while right in order to ping 30 different levels and wait for timeouts and everything else a trace route command can take something like 30 seconds to a minute so if you put a trace route, so basically you're using popen, and you say, you know, trace route to cnn.com, just realize when you run that script, you're not going to get a response back in one or two seconds. Literally, that script is going to run, and it's going to wait for a trace route to be finished, and then it will give you a response. And that's the other thing to be thinking about with, uh, with coding and programming, is we talk about things like sub processes and subsystems, is maybe, maybe what you want to do is you want to have a script over here that you know every five minutes runs a trace route command, dumps the value into a database, and then your main script every so often goes to that database to pull out the value that's been provided from the other script. That's one of those things that you just gotta consider. Uh, grep is going to be your friend. So again, parsing is a big deal in programming. So what parsing is, is having your script be able to read, uh, you know, whatever the, the data is that comes into it. Uh, what grep does is really cool, especially for these, uh, these command line utilities, is essentially you can say, only give me the lines with specific values in it. Right. So again, you do something like the IP, I want IP address, and especially nowadays, Jesus. You get like 20 returns for some reason. Like, I don't want this. I just want like IPv4 or whatever. And so what you can say is you can say IP address, uh, uh, pipe, uh, grep, and then do like IPv4 or whatever the, the specific syntax is. And then we'll only give you back, you'll only get back uh, any line that has IPv4 in it. Uh, so again, that's one of those things you have to be thinking about parsing. And again, the layered approach is like, okay, so I'm gonna use this command, I'm gonna pipe it through grep, so I only get back the, the you know, most of the results that I need. And then once I have those limited results, then I'll read through that. Uh, we have the read uh, function or the read method. So the read method is going to take the p open p open value that comes back and turn it all uh, into one string. So however big it is, it's going to turn it into one string. Read lines uh, as we dealt with before that will turn it, each line into a value in a list. Right. So uh, line line one will be index zero. Line two, line three, line four. The line goes. Uh, OS p open. Uh, we got this particular script here. Uh, so yeah, so basically we have this uh, command. So import OS, command equals, so we're simply going to do ls hyphen L, response equals uh, OS dot P open, command, so that command that's going in, dot read. So we're going to turn it into, and we're going to turn it into one string, and then we're going to print out the response. We run through, and so again, we got ls, ls hyphen l so basically this is just list all the folders and this is what we get so this comes back as a string but what if what if we wanted these again in order to parse it what if a, each one of these lines we wanted to be a value uh, in a in a list well that's where you could do uh the read lines instead and so os.p open command that read lines and now again this is 
this is ugly this is ugly but right so if you can tell right so anyways where is it here is the open square bracket and then if you go let's see that's one index value so the total items is 1072 so that's index zero and then we keep going till we find another comma right so then that is index one that is index two right again that might be valuable for you again if you're doing that trace route so again you got you have 30 responses that come back instead of having a string if you have those as index values it might be easier for you to parse through um let me uh do this this um now you can do um the ping command right and so again this is for the linux mac world so the command is going to be ping hyphen c for count how many times we want to ping one and you do cnn.com right we're going to read and so basically we're going to ping we're going to get the response back we're then going to assign that response as the value uh, of response and then we simply print that out so there we go so i pinged i pinged cnn.com and i get this response back and so again, if I want to do a very simple up down tool, we're actually going to do in a couple of minutes, I now have this value back and I can parse this value to see if I get one packets received. If I get one packets received, then I know the host is up. If I don't, then most likely the host is down, right? I can now test based off of this value. Um, with that, again, when I ran this though, again, you're getting all of this. Again, this is just for a ping now. Uh, that's a lot. That's a lot to get back. And it's a lot for your computer to deal with, right? The, 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 you, you want your script to only deal with the data that it actually needs to deal with. So what you can do is you can use grep. And what grep does is, again, it will only send back the lines with a particular word in it. Right, so ping hyphen c one cnn.com the pipe grep. I only want lines that have the word packet in it. If I then run this, you can see I only get one uh, line, right? And this is a hell of a lot easier to parse one packet transmitted, one packet received, zero, zero packet loss, right? So that is the one line that gets back, and so that's easier uh, to test upon. And that's basically uh, what you have, again, for the P open. Um, again, so read brings back the string value, read lines brings back a, you know, a list value, and again, grep is a very valuable thing. Uh, let's see here. Then we get to the try accept. Uh, so try accept is an important thing. Again, there's a question with some of the smart people out there about whether or not I should have taught you try accept a couple of classes ago. Um, but again, you got to teach people some, all this stuff at some point. When you teach it, who the hell knows? Try accept statements are very important in the Python world. And the reason that they're very important in the Python world is, because, again, Python is that super glue to all kinds of different things, whether it's the operating system, whether it's the API, whether it's the databases, all of that kind of thing. One of the issues, though, with Python uh, is that if it doesn't get a response it likes, it fails. We don't like that. It dies, right? It's just, just how it is. Um, and so one of the problems you can have, again, let's say you tr go to try to save a file, right? Let's say like, I get this data, I get this data from the ping command, and I want to save it to a file. Um, now, let's say the privilege for that file is wrong, or let's say that file is open by another uh, process and it's locked for some reason, even though it shouldn't be at this point in time, but it is. Let's say there's any kinds of problem with that file. The issue that you're going to have is not only is Python going to fail to save the data in that file, but it's also going to fail, <laughs> right? So if you have an auto automatic script going on, so again, let's let's just say you have a you have a little Raspberry Pi, 
and you put a Python script on it. And again, you have it doing something. You have it doing network monitoring or whatever else. And it's just on a nice little while true loop. It gets the responses in, it dumps it into a file, and then you do something with the file later, right? And it does it. And it's just doing that for days and days and days and days and days, and you don't even think about it anymore. The problem is, again, if something happens with a file or something happens with the specific things that it needs to interact with, not only is that iteration of the task going to fail, but the entire script is going to poop the hell out. And then your little system is crashed. So again, ima imagine if you, if you have a dashboard, right? Imagine if you're very proactive as an IT professional, you want your users to understand what's going on with the network. And so you have this little script that's continuously pinging uh, and then it, it, it prints those results basically to an HTML file that auto updates. I'm actually going to show you how to do that in a few minutes. Um, and then you, that's just connected to a big ass screen. And so everybody in your environment, if they think they're having a problem with the network, they can just look at this big ass screen and they can see whether things are green or red or yellow or whatever else. Right. And it's just up there just doing its little thing forever and ever and ever and ever. And then all of a sudden it stops updating and it stops updating. Because for some reason, when, when it went to save a file or do whatever else, that process didn't work properly. The script failed, and now your system isn't working. So what the try except allows you to do is it says try to do a task. If the task doesn't work for some reason, it's okay. It's like a chihuahua. You're like, it's okay. It's going to be okay. And then you give it a different command. Try to do this. If that doesn't work, do something else and go on from there, right? And so the script will keep running, even if that particular iteration fails for some reason. One of the things you do have to think about with this is with the try except, uh, what is an error really? Again, there's errors and then there's just crappy returns. Uh, so when you're testing, so when you try to do something, again, let's say access a file or something folder and it completely fails, that will be a failure. Sometimes, though, when you're trying to do a ping command or when you're trying to do other commands, the command fails, but it gives a return back. So as, soon, as far as the try and accept statement is concerned, it still worked, right? If it's, if, if, the, if it's looking for a return and it gets any return at all, then the return worked. So you got to be careful with that. So anyways, what you're going to do is you're going to say try, try to do something. If that does not work for some reason, accept, do this other thing. Uh, except exception as error. Uh, basically what this is, is this can tell you what the error is. So this might be an important thing, like why, why wasn't I able to do whatever it is I'm trying to do? Else, so what else is, else is not except. So again, we have if else statements. Eh. So basically what this is, says is try. If this works, then also, this should be also. Basically think of else is also. If try works, else also do that right so if 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 try doesn't work it'll do except and it won't do else if try works then else is whatever additional stuff that you want to do so it might be like tr try to connect to a database right if you connect it to the database and then do this with the data right try to connect to the database that didn't work for some reason do accept anyways so try else and then you have finally and what finally is is just at the end of this entire statement regardless of whether it worked or it didn't work this is what you want to have happen have a nice day whether your customer is happy or whether your customer is pissed off you're always going to print out have a nice day that's what finally is and of course i forgot to put where my thing is where's my try accept try accept um okay so this should fail over again uh, so this is all it is. Again, we have no modules coming in here because we don't need modules for the try accept statement. So try. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to open uh, a file and read from it. So again, let's say we're trying to read something maybe over the network, right? I'm trying to read log files. So again, we think about with Python, you can do a lot of stuff. So maybe I'm reading uh, log files from all over the network from a whole bunch of different devices, and then I'm parsing that and doing something with it. All right, so anyways, with open no hyphen file.txt, read uh, r for read as file, then I say data equals file.read. So take anything in here, turn it into a string, assign that value to data. Except if this does not work for some reason, print.
else. Uh, print the data out. Uh, finally, print thanks for play. So basically, it's going to try to do this. If it doesn't work, it'll print out error. If this does work, it will print out the data. And finally, it'll print out thanks for play. Uh, when we go to run this, it should fail. There we go. So it printed out error, right? So it went. So if we go over to my folder, uh, we don't have that particular uh, file here. So when I try to open it up, it did not work. Uh, so we get the error, right? So um, accept, we get the accept error, and then it does finally, uh, thanks for playing. If we want to do uh, find out what the actual error was, right? So You can either do accept or accept action, uh, exception basically is error. So it's the exception and then we're doing an alias as error. So whatever the exception is, we're gonna call that error. And so we're gonna print out whatever the error actually is here. And when we do that, we can see error number two, error two no such file or directory, no hyphen file dot txt. So we tried to open it, but wasn't able to open it. At this point, we now have, um, that error so we know what the hell is going on. And again, this might be an important thing. We're trying to access stuff over the network, whatever else. Uh, let's do command new, uh, control S, and uh, uh, what the hell did I just call that? No file.txt, control S, no hyphen file.txt. So I'm actually saving this. Um, this is a file with some data in it. So again, this could be a CSV file, log file, whatever else. Now we do the try accept. We hit run. Oops. No hyphen file.txt. Oh, you're killing me here. Where did this get saved? File. Save. Save as. Oh, there you go. Saving my root directory, right? I saved it in the wrong place. Of course I did. Oh, now we go to try accept. Now we go to run it. And we can see, so data equals file.read. So this actually did work. So we go to else, print the value that came in. This is a file with some data in it. And then finally, thanks for playing. All right, so that's the basic idea of the try accept statements. And don't worry, we are going to be doing a metric crap ton of them uh, going into the future. So that is the main core of the class. We're now going to go into the labs. At this point, is there any question on what we're doing? Any hands? Nope, no hands. Okay, then we're going to go into the labs. Uh, let's see here, lab command. So this is a pretty simple one right here. Uh, so basically all we're going to be doing is we're going to be sending uh, commands to the operating system uh, using the input function like we've done many times before. And then we're simply going to be getting the responses back uh, so we can sit here and play around with it. Uh, let's see here. So import OS. So we're importing the OS module. Then we're going to send to the operating system os.systemclear. All right. So every time we run a script, you'll notice there's always that kind of header information there. That's really ugly and nasty. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're just going to wipe that off. We're just going to clean that off so we get a nice clean black screen. Uh, again, if you're in Windows, it's CLS. So while true, while true means continuously forever and ever. Command equals input, and this is just the text that shows up on the screen, command. And then we're going to do os.systemclear. So you're going to type in the command, and then it's just going to clear anything that's previously been there. So whenever we get responses in the future, it'll make sure to clear those away. Um, try response equals os, p open, 
the command read, right? So with P open, we're going to send the command to the operating system, and then we're going to turn that into a value, and then we're going to assign that to response. Except if for some reason that does not work, response equals error, and then we're simply going to print response on the screen to make life easy, right? So if I go here, Again, see, see how it cleaned everything out? So now I just get that nice little command prompt. So this is where you can start actually building some command line tools, right? So again, you could be running this from your normal terminal, from your normal command line. And so, right, you can just you know start, the, uh, start your little script, you can run it, and now you've got the prompt. Uh, so command, I can do, let's say, ls. I do that, and then I get all the items that are in file right ls um i can do a ping uh, hyphen c1 cnn.com and then it gives me the response and ping cnn.com 151 101 and it gives me that back um i don't know i could do a touch um i don't know if the response will be back a uh, new file.txt now there's no response from touch so i just did it and we get that back, but we have the new file exists. So basically, you can sit here and you can start playing around with it. Uh, so I guess you could send top. Can you send top? Let's see if you can send top. Top might fail. Ah, uh, yeah. Top is never going to give you a return. So top is kind of like a, a, a man line activity monitor. And so you start it, and it doesn't stop unless you manually stop it. So that will kill it. So anyways, that is just a lab uh, for you to do to start playing around with. And so this is allowing you to interactively be able to send commands to your operating system. And then you can play around with that a little bit. Uh, the next one is the up down lab. And basically what this is, is it's trying to see whether an operate, uh, whether a host is up or down and it's continuously uh, looping through. Uh, here we're going to use a function uh, since, you know, function is the big here, thing here. Uh, so we have a import OS, OS module from time import sleep because we want to pause this again. When we start doing loops, especially while true loops, remember to go as fast as the little CPU will allow it. Sometimes you don't want that. You want it to slow down just a little bit. So anyways, sleep is the way you can do that. Uh, we're just going to have a single site here. So site equals CNN.com. You can do Fox. You can do Taco Bell. I don't care. Just using CNN.com. And so what happens here is we come down to our while true loop. So while true forever. OS, not system, clear, clear the screen. Result equals status function of the site. So we're going to create a little function, essentially, for pinging whatever site that we care about. And then we're going to send the site value. So we're going to go to status. We're going to send the site value. Command equals F string, ping, hyphen C, one, that site value. Response equals OS dot P open, command dot read. So whatever the response is, and then we're going to return the response. So result is going to equal what the return is. We're then going to print the site name on the screen. So what we have up here, CNN.com, we're going to print that on the screen. We're going to print the result, whatever the result is, and then we're going to sleep it for one second. If we go and we run this, now we can see is every second it's updating. And uh, you can tell that by latency here. So that's one thing, too. If you're doing, like, auto-updating, how do you know if it's actually updating? Well, things like latency. So latency is almost always going to be slightly different. Like, things like IP addresses. The IP address is going to stay the same for a long, long time. But things like latency. Latency is how long it takes for the packet to get from your computer to the, uh, to the host machine. Uh, and so with this, this is always going to be updating. And so we can see that, you know, latency to CNN.com is about 35 seconds. And then we get this response back. So, uh, so again, if you're doing like some kind of uh, troubleshooting routine, let's say you're working with the servers on your network, you're, you're doing something like that, uh, simply having something like this up on one of your uh, one of your screens might be useful to verify whether or not you actually uh, are communicating with the outside world or not. So that is the basic idea of this particular script, right? Pretty simple. Uh, the final one is where we get to something that is a little more real. 
again, I'm always trying, I'm always trying to push you folks, you know, in the direction of actually building something that might be useful. And what this is going to do is this is going to create a, a, an auto uh, updating uh, dashboard uh, for us. Um, and basically what it's going to do is it's going to ping all of these different hosts. You could put in IP addresses, you could put in hosts, whatever else is going to ping those. We're going to get the response back. And then based off of the value of the response, we are then going to create an HTML dashboard and have it be color coded. So import OS from time import sleep site. So this is a list of sites, CNN, Fox, Taco Bell, and not a real site.tv. And then we're going to do header. So this is going to be for our HTML web page. So two things need to happen. Again, that's one thing you have to think about. Got to think about systems. So we want this Python script to continuously run so that we're continuously pinging these sites to verify they're up or down. But then we also need the web page to auto update, right? So if we have Python continuously running, but the HTML page never auto updates, then how do you know if the current page is what the world looks like? So what you can do here is this is called a meta tag. So HTTP, uh, meta, HTTP equiv, refresh content every five seconds. What this will do for an HTML page is it will auto refresh itself. So it's automatically going to refresh itself every five seconds or however, however many seconds you want. I would, I would recommend don't put it too low because everything does have to load. You know, so five seconds is about probably about the lowest you want to do, especially if you're reading just text, something like just like text. No, you put just put this up to a couple of minutes if you want to. Anyways, uh, we have the function we'll talk about in a second, and then we come down here to our while true loop. Uh, OS, not system, we're just going to clear the screen. Page, so we're going to be creating an HTML page. So the first thing that we're going to add to our HTML page every time we loop through is the header, right? So we're going to write that auto update header, and then when it auto updates, we need to make sure that that, that header is there in the future, so we'll auto update again. So we're going to add the header. For item insight, so for all those values in the list, result equals status item, right? So status is the function and item is the value in the list. If we go up and we take a look at this, this function, so status, so site is coming in. So it's, it's called item down here, but again, it's by based off the index. So we're going to call it site from here on out. We're going to default the color to being red just make life a little bit easier. So basically the default color is going to be red as in bad. And then we have to get a good ping back for it to be good. Command equals ping C one, whatever the site is. Response equals OS P open command read. So if one packets received in response. And so again, this is where you have to look at parsing. So um, if you're using Linux, I do believe it's if one packet receive uh, packets. So again, if, if, if any of this doesn't work, actually do a ping command, see what you get back, and then put that in there. So anyways, so this is for Mac. So if one packet's received is in the response, in that string response that come back, comes back, color is going to equal green. So it was red, now it's green, All right? Then we're going to return. We're going to return uh, what the response was, and we're going to return what the color is. So then we're going to come down here. So page, right? So page, we added the header. Now page equals, so it's an F string. Again, three, uh, three single quotation marks or double quotation marks allows us to put things on multiple lines. Um, so page, as it has been before, H2 style. So this is CSS background color equals result one, right? So you look up here. This is zero. This will be result zero. This is result one. So the color is result one. So the background color is going to be whatever got determined up there. Then we're going to put in um, the item. So the site. So this is with an H1. So it'll be CNN.com, Fox.com, that type of thing. We close the H2. We then use the pre tag. So in HTML, there's something called the pre tag. I don't think we went over it before. Basically, all this is for text information. You keep the pre formatting. Basically, you leave the formatting as it used to be, so you don't have to do a lot of fancy stuff. So this is very useful for for quick and dirty apps you're going to create. So basically, we're going to say as it is already formatted, we then also want to print or we want to put in a result zero. 
So what's going to happen is it's going to add the header, then it's going to loop through each, uh, each site, each host. It will then figure out whether or not it received a response, uh, basically get that response back. If it got a good response, the color will then be green. If not, it'll be red, and then it will add that to this HTML page. Then we're going to say uh, is try with open dashboard.html. So we're going to open up a file dashboard.html. W for overwrite as file, file.write page. So we're simply going to write this again into my home directory. Except, so for some reason this does not work, we're simply going to print out on the screen error writing to file. That's it, because we can't write it to the file, so we're just going to give us an error, and then we're going to sleep for one second. So the HTML page will update every five seconds. This will loop every one second. Again, how you do that, that's kind of up to you. Uh, then when we go, when we take a look at this, I can then run this. We're getting a return. This, this isn't actually a Python return. This is actually just... Um, uh, what comes up on the shell screen. You can get rid of this if you want to. Anyways, so this isn't actually coming from Python. This is coming from the operating system itself. But the important thing is we can go over. We can see that a file called da dashboard.html got created. I can simply double click on this. Since it's HTML, it'll open in whatever your default web browser is. And so we can see, say CNN.com is green, has a green background. How does it ping work? Again, one packet's received. I can see that the uh, the latency is 33 milliseconds, whatever else. Fox.com, again, also green. I can see the latency is 27 uh, milliseconds. TacoBell.com, again, and this is where you can do weird troubleshooting stuff. Like, I far apparently, I farted with my computer at some point, and I don't even remember it, because I was looking at this. Look at the latency. Look at this. Can you see that latency? I don't know if you can see that latency. This is like ridiculous latency. Look at that. It's 0 0.041 milliseconds. I was like, what the, how the hell do you get a latency like that? And you get a latency like that if you fucked with your host file at some point and you're pointing Taco Bell to 127.0.0.1, which is your loopback address. Um, not sure why I did that, but apparently I did that at some point in time. So anyways, again, you get that troubleshooting. And then not a real site.tv. Uh, it's not getting any kind of response back because it doesn't actually exist. Um, and that is red. Uh, so again, if you if you had a site that was supposed to be up and you weren't, you weren't getting your responses, uh, this should also come up and also be in red. Basically, it's looking for that one packets received. And uh, and yeah, and so those are the labs. That's about the class. So um, I will stick around. I don't, know what, even, I don't even know what time it is anymore. Three fifty-one already. So I'll stick around for I don't know to about four twenty. I'll be in and out. Uh, if you uh, want to work on the labs, you can work on the labs. If you run into a problem, you can you can raise your hand. We can try to figure out what's going on. Uh, if you don't, then you can go away. You can leave. Class is over. Uh, but I'll stick around for about thirty minutes if anybody needs help. Um, is there is there any questions? Is there any questions? Let's see here. Uh, Windows users first lab replace OS. Yeah. Man, yeah. Okay. Windows users second lab replace F ping with command F ping in one. Okay. There you go. Yes, there are different commands in Windows. Well, that's why you use Windows. I mean, you, the only reason anybody uses Windows is because they like to do a lot of extra work and not get paid for it. <clears throat> oh, Stroud, yeah. What's up, Stroud? So going, um, thank you, I'm, I have to run in a minute, but going back, so base we're covering the lab we did before the sensor lab uh, a few nights on July 12th. And it's the same function as that one, but instead of, so that's why I'm curious, like we're using a different form right now during that lab, we used wild true temperature, 
brand in color, if temp, those things like that. Yep. But for this one, I mean, because we were we were simulating pinging something. Um, so I'm curious why the the oh okay, never mind. <laughs> never mind. You just showed me. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yep. you, you answered my question without even showing. All right, I gotta go. Thank you so much. Look forward to the next lab. All right, cool. See ya. Um, yeah, the big thing, I'm not sure what he took away, but again, why we're doing the function now is again, when you're, when you're looping through. So again, the problem is with teaching people is again, you gotta, you gotta silo this to some degree or it's gonna get stupid. And so again, that's where I'm just using this list here. But again, with any of this kind of stuff, if, the, if this information is coming in um, from, again, a data store, CSV, most likely a database, something like that. I mean, again, this could, this could dynamically be anywhere between five values to 5,000 values. Again, an interesting thing to be thinking about, um, it came up, so with um, uh, SaaS, so uh, software as a service. One of the issues that you run into is uh, IP addresses. All right, so there's something called GeoDNS. And basically what GeoDNS does is it tries to route you or it tries to route the user to the actual physical closest um, server, All right? So, uh, so we've got the planet here, you know, we've got all of these servers, right? All over the planet and you're, and you're here, right? So basically, so if I try to go to like salesforce.com, it might send me like I'm here, and so it might try to send me to this server, and this server is I don't know uh, 201.66.22.5, right? So basically, I go to my DNS server, I have DNS, and I say I want to know, I want to resolve Salesforce.com to an IP address. That DNS server will see where I'm located, and it will give me that particular IP address. Right. You're somewhere else on the planet and you want to go to salesforce.com, then it will give you, you know, to 216.155.1, right? It might give you an entirely different IP address. Where this gets really freaking confusing, though, is when we talk about clusters, right? So when you think about this, right, you think about a data center, you think about like one IP address. The reality is, is you may have a rack of servers, in that uh, in that data center, and all of them may have um, web addressable IP addresses. Right? This has one, and this has one, and this is one, and this is one, and this is one. So one of the issues you can have is when you have users at your office, the first person goes and they get auto directed to this server, and their stuff works fine. And the next person goes and gets auto directed to this server, and their stuff works fine. And the next person goes and they get auto directed to this server. And that server is down for some reason. And the next person goes and they're fine. The next person goes and this server is down. So now all of a sudden, some of your users, Salesforce is working fine. Some of your users, Salesforce isn't working fine. And your help desk is going to hell, right? And you don't know because you, you sit there and when you ping, so you resolve to Salesforce, you get the IP address, you ping, and whenever you ping, you're getting this server for some reason. So it seems like it's up to you. Again, it's, a, it's the whole thing in the tech world. It works for me. It works for me. And so anyways, one of the things that you might do is you might actually try to figure out what the hell all the different IP addresses that your users might end up trying to connect to with that Salesforce. And then you can plug all of those again into a database table so you do salesforce ip address 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 right and now those are all values that you can have your python script basically pull all of those values and then run run this function off of to see whether these are up or down and so again it may be many different things Right. You may have you may have 10 different IP addresses for Twilio. You might have 10 different IP addresses for Office 365. Blase, 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 right. And so literally, even with not very many services that you're using online, you might end up with, you know, 100 different IP addresses that you're just constantly pinging 
just to make sure that they're there, right? So if there's a problem, you know. And so that's why it's important to start coming up with these kinds of functions so you just have that very easy reusability. So instead of rewriting crap 100 times, you just call back to that function. Not a real site.tv is returning back an IP format. Well, there you go. Maybe it's uh, maybe it was geo targeting your area. Um, Should have. Yeah. <laughs> uh, paying um, not a real site. TV. Cannot resolve. Not a real site.tv. Is that what you're really doing? Not a real site.tv. Fascinating. Not not resolving for me. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, also for Windows, the result for ping in the site needs to be checked against received equals one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Or you can just buy a Mac. Or you can just buy a Mac. I'm giving you classes for free. The least you can do is buy a three thousand dollar computer. Come on now. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. It'll 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 be interesting for the people following along. What happens when we start getting into the more complicated stuff with Windows? Um, yeah. Secondhand Macs are expensive here. A seven-year-old MacBook costs as much as a laptop with an 11th gen i5. Yeah. I don't know where you're at. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the hard part, right? I don't know where you're at. Uh, for anybody here in America, something called backmarket.com. Uh, backmarket. And, uh, yeah, for... Uh, for old Max, it's pretty good. Like again, if you're gonna buy, if you're gonna buy something, again, I would say a um, an Intel. I think an Intel MacBook Pro is the best. If you want a lab computer, and the reason why the Intel MacBook Pro is best is not because it's the best computer. <laughs> Believe me, I own a couple of like the 2019s. They ain't so good. The good part about it is you can basically install any OS you want onto it. Um, and uh yeah i don't know let's see a macbook pro um yeah i don't know 2017 eight gigs yeah eight gigs isn't good uh, let's see here what would a 2019 macbook pro cost price low to high Eight gigs of RAM. Yeah, okay, that sucks. I will admit eight gigs of RAM sucks. Yeah, I don't know. So a 13, a 13 inch, 16 gigs of RAM, 128 drive, solid state drive. Yeah, it's 54 joint, 371 bucks. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there you go. Uh 512 gigs, 373. That's eight gigs. Yeah, I don't know. Man. I know to say that with with uh with uh Apple. I don't really understand what they do with their um, their resource, like I say, like the RAM or the hard drive. Like everything should get 512 gigs of storage and everything should get at least 16 gigs. But that's not how they work. Um, what if we go back to 2017? Um, let's see, what if we say memory, 16 gigs or more, and I guess they do start getting expensive. 32 gigs, i7, 32 gigs, 2019. Oh, 500 bucks. That's why I do like these things. Again, I do have to say they are, uh, they are old. They're now 12 years old. But um, again, it's like 130 bucks they paid for them. 2012. Yeah, low to high. Yeah, there you go. MacBook Pro, 
13 inch, um, four gigs of RAM. That's what this has. Yeah, 112 bucks. 112 bucks. So if all you to be clear, if all you're going to be doing is Python, if all you're going to do is Python, basic administrative basic administrative tasks, bottle. This is what we're going to do Django, SQL, structured query language. Um, these are actually fine. These these actually work surprisingly well. Uh, the only place that they get bogged down again when we start doing computer vision, um, and it's not even when we talk about AI again. One of the things you have to be thinking about. I talk about architecture a lot, and because uh, I like architecture, I'm a systems guy. But anyways, architecture is an important thing to be thinking about when you use AI, and you're like, but you, but Eli. AI won't run on that $110 piece of garbage. And it's like, you're right. <laughs> well, actually, it will. You can put Olama on here. I actually put Olama on one of these and use like the Pi. Microsoft has a small model. You can actually do, you can actually do local AI, LLM on this. But anyways, the important thing to understand with AI though, is if you're using APIs, right? APIs. The processing doesn't occur here. This takes your request with all of your variable values, sends it to the API, sends it up through the API to all of OpenAI's $200,000 servers. Those $200,000 servers process a response, send it back here. And so basically, even though you're dealing with AI, your computer isn't dealing with AI. So again, like, so if you, if you're going to run open CV, you can, you be clear, you can run open CV on this. It's a bit of a dog, right? But if you're going to use this to take an image, send this image to open AI to process and get a response back in all seriousness, this is not going to be that much slower oops, than a brand new, you know, M3 MacBook Pro with a thousand gigs of RAM. The reason is, is because all you're actually doing, you're just dealing with text. You're just simply dealing with an image file that you're sending, and then you're parsing a text response that comes back. Um, so that is one of those things to be thinking about, especially like with lab computers. Is um, again, this thing, this thing is 12 years old, maybe 13 years old at this point, point. Uh, and it's surprising how well it works for many tasks. So I just you know, keep that in mind. Hmm. After those classes, I don't believe any more of those who tell you can make a lot of sasses with no code and any experiences. Oh, yeah, no, you need to, you need to know how to code. <laughs> if you're going to build a startup, you got to learn how to code. Um, yeah, there's a lot of like the low code, no code. I find the people that talk a lot about low code, no code, many times don't know anything about code. So anyways, yeah. Um, yeah, AI will run in the cloud with an API key. Also, Alama CPP can run on ARM Android phones from five years ago. It's not fast, but it's reasonable for a proof of concept. Well, yeah, so, oh, Llama CPP. Yeah, so, so Llama is, um, Llama is Meta's model. I don't know how big that model. I don't know why you're running a five-year-old smartphone. They've got like a three, was it three bill? Is it three billion parameter? Three million. Anyways, their smallest, smallest, this teeny tiniest version will probably run on a smartphone from a couple of years ago. Again, run. Ron is is being very 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 kind, but uh, yeah, yeah. So whenever we talk about it, so Llama is Meta's uh, LLM, and then Olama, Olama is a cool one. Uh, that's that's actually a framework, so that you can run any or a lot of LLMs. Uh, on your system. Uh, so again, we're going to be having a class on this in the future. Uh, so basically what Olama allows you to do is they've created a framework that allows you to run other LLMs. And the cool part about it is if Olama is running on your system, you can actually have Python communicate with Olama and its libraries instead of going out to the APIs. Um, 
Mark Zuckerberg, again, it's weird with Meta. It's weird with Meta. Um, Facebook is absolutely horrid to its users. Facebook is just vicious and nasty and god awful to its users. Um, it's surprisingly good for the tech community, though. Again, React. React actually comes from Facebook. Uh, React is a, you know, again, write once, you know, run anywhere type of coding language. Uh, so with, with Llama, I guess, they, I guess they just came out with Llama 3. Basically, he's just, it's not quite open source. He's almost open sourced it. Basically, as long as your company has less than fewer than 700 million monthly users, you can use it for free. As long as you have the hardware, you can just run it for free. And so there is an interesting question with all these LLMs. We talk about the value of companies like OpenAI. As as more of these LLMs become available that you can basically run on a potato, are you still going to be going to open AI? You can either run everything locally or within your infrastructure and get the results and not worry about what open AI is doing with your data, or you can pay open AI. So anyways, it's an interesting question. But yeah, if you haven't played with it a lot, it's, it's dirt simple. You download it. You do pull, basically you run Olama, pull the, uh, the, 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 uh, the model that you want, and then you just basically run that model and use it. It's pretty cool. So, so, any questions, any questions, any questions? And we've got no questions. Got no questions. Well, if you guys have no questions, then I have no answers. <laughs> I have no answers. Uh, so yeah, okay, it's about, yeah close enough to 420 um ah, 420 uh so yeah um, um what is i gonna say on uh, tuesday we will be having the uh, open ai class on thursday we'll have web scraping uh with open ai um and this class should be on uh youtube uh, most likely tomorrow so if you don't know about it again my eli the computer guy channel oh back when i used to be important million subscribers that nobody watches. Anyways, this does exist. Elon, the computer guy on YouTube. Uh, and basically the classes um, are here. So CSS introduction, the HTML introduction. That's not what it should be at this point. Um, there we go. Yep, so the REST API. So we did the REST API class before. So if you miss any of these classes, uh, you can you can come here and you can watch the classes. And then also, again, all of the code, all of the notes, everything is simply sitting up here in this GitHub repository. Uh, so, so yeah, basically you can take the class yeah, at your own leisure, I suppose. So, yep, that's about all I got for you. So I shall see you all next week.